Welcome to the Real Estate Mogul MD Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and taking control of your financial future. This is a show where we not only motivate and inspire, we give you actionable, real-world experience to help you live life by design. You'll hear journeys and stories from other physicians, investors, coaches, consultants, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, Brett Riggins. All right, everybody. Today, we're actually, we're going to flip the script here a little bit. We're actually speaking with someone who is a child of a medical professional. Uh, So today's guest is a well-recognized seven-figure income stock options coach and real estate investor who is now also an entrepreneur. Over 10 years of expertise in the investment industry, absolutely revolutionizing stock option investing in the financial game for aspiring elite professionals. And this, remember, this guy is coming from the family of a physician as well, too. Everybody, please welcome Cody Yeh to the show. So, Cody, we were just talking about um, your history and leading up uh, into how we met. And uh, the first thing that we said, we're both not physicians, but everybody listening to this is a physician. So how in the world did we get onto a podcast with uh, with physicians and we're not physicians? Tell tell the listeners a little bit about that. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. Um, first of all, I have a lot of physician clients. They are the best, very intelligent, are very trustworthy, and they know the numbers. So um, they just too focus on what they're doing a lot of times forget about the true bigger picture of the finance journey. Um, so the reason why I said that is because I grew up in a doctor family. So my dad is an anesthesiologist from uh, Taiwan. Um, and he luckily gave me a choice of not being a doctor. And he said, if you want it, you can be it, but you know, you don't, there's no pressure, not the typical Asian pressure for that. Um, so. I was very lucky that side. Uh, growing up, I seen a lot of good and bad side about um, in the doctor's family. The good side would be that uh, from the outside, you have a high status. Um, but inside, actually, my dad's a really good doctor, but he's not good with money. That means that he lost money in a lot of uh, businesses, investing in stocks, investing in restaurants and all that. And he didn't really do his own due diligence and he didn't go to school for that. So I would say a lot of friction between the family and my mom. And even eventually when I studied abroad in Canada, that really almost put my study to a stop because that was 2010 and the market crash, everything kind of, you know, turns the other way. And I almost, you know, we just didn't have enough money for the second year of my engineering degree. So that's really the moment I figure out no matter what happened, I want to take control of finance. So uh, even right now, I help a lot of physicians, nurses, PTs, OTs, and all that. It's really just, that's my drive, right? Because I've seen it. I suffer. I think I suffer so much. I I can't compare it to other people, but I truly think uh, less people should suffer what we suffer and uh, and just have a better (laughs) growing up journey and just financial journey in general. Very interesting. So the the twist on today's episode is this is from the the family side of yes. of that of this um you know taking that medical journey, medicine journey and being so focused on that passion and we hear it so many times of that takes away from the family, uh creates situations with the family and then doubled by the uh, financial challenge of that too. And the twist of today, Cody, is from the, um, from the children's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yes. It's, it just, I'm very happy. Um, I I just feel because growing up, um, Truly, everyone think we have to, the, the the best life, right? From the outside, yes, we make high incomes and all that. But when we don't know how to save money or invest, uh, truly, the income is actually not that much. And uh, very soon, the, the lifestyle creep on and you get into debt. And then 
when you don't know about money, you double down on the things that you shouldn't double down and start borrowing money that you should have been borrowed on a higher interest rate. And, you know, uh, my dad didn't know how to invest in real estate or <laughs> really just kind of what I call maybe gambling in the stock market and then oh. using margins and all that crazy things. Um, yeah, just uh, leave a scar on me, but I just turned that scar into motivation on helping more people uh, who have similar situation. It doesn't ha just have to be physician or it could be anyone that has high income, low incomes or any status, just take back the control when you don't have to ask for money. It's a very powerful thing, right? Uh, then you kind of have like an inside uh, perspective of this. What what was what were the biggest changes that you felt in in your own personal direction? Now being so experienced in finances, and uh, you know having the results to to show your experience as well too. What were the biggest changes that that stand out to you? Mm. Um, I'll say. The biggest changes will be um, the feeling of control. Um, it might sound cliche, but uh, when you're always asking for money, whether it's from your parents or, or having a single source of income, it's actually very stressful because uh, life do happen. You know, you I have a fiance, I might start having kids and all that. I want more of my time back, but if I don't have control, I might need to put in more time. So having multiple streams of income, having that control really give me the peace of mind to really live in a moment and knowing that the money will keep coming in in whatever way that is, and just truly being able to enjoy and have a little bit more safe up and continue to invest. So I think it's just in a really good space, what we call always call financial freedom, right? And I'm always learning. I want to say I know it all. I'm still learning all about the higher level things of how the matrix actually work, but um, it's just a journey, right? And what would you say are some of the, the best ways to make that uh, happen with the multiple streams of income? Because I, ha I had a conversation the other day and then, you know, we kind of have this feeling that multiple streams of income is a luxury, but it's not, it should almost be seen as a necessity. And then if it's a necessity, then you get that sense of freedom because if one falls, the other one's carrying, right? So there's that, it removes the stress from us. What are some suggestions that you would give the listeners on those multiple streams of income? Um, so I'll take, because I have quite some uh, physician clients as well. I, have a, I actually have a client that's an anesthesiologist as well, I'll use him as example. So he works for a hospital making mid six figure. And then he also worked for other clinic, make another mid six figure. But because of, of those two jobs, he's making almost near a million dollar. But for him is he spent almost a hundred hour to 120 hour every week. Wow. On the job, on two jobs, right? So when he reached out to me, he's like, Cody, how can I replace this income with a lot less time put in, a lot less stress? Um, and that's, you know, what I help people with, we, with our, you know, set and done strategy and stock option investing, all that. If you guys are interested, go check out the YouTube video. Um, but coming back to this, I think for them, the first step is to realize that they need it and truly identify why they need it? Is it more money or do they want more time back and how they're going to spend those time, right? Because until that's very clear, if someone comes in and say, Cody, I just want to make more money. And I, I got to ask that question before. I said, Cody, when is enough for you? And a lot of people don't know. They just keep having their peer pressure, join the golf clubs and all that stuff, right? So until that is clear, for people, I think, um, and until that's clear for people, people can know how to take action. So understanding the why. But fast money as in, um, it's like your active income. 
your W-2 or your T-4 paycheck, okay, or your active business income, or in our case is our sun done strategy where we get consistent cash flow, or it could be real estate cash flow, right? And then that's the fast money. If you get that part done and set up well and have multiple stream of that, then you will always know that no matter what happened, your expense is a lot lower. It will be covered by those active income, the fast money. And then the medium money could, could mean like, um, you know, um, flipping, flipping actually quite fast money as well. It depends. could be more like you are uh, buying a, um, a fixer upper real estate and try to, um, you know, add value to your refinance. All that is probably medium term that might get stuck for a few months. And then the slow money is where you build up the wealth. Like for example, you just buy insurance, con- com- uh, buy insurance policy, buy and hold real estate, buy and hold stocks, get paid dividend. So that's where the fast, medium, and slow money. So you really need to figure out the fast money so that you have money to invest in the medium money and the slow money. And if any of those get in trouble, all the other ones can compensate on that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So this this multiple streams of income in, in three kind of buckets, fast, medium, mm-hmm. and slow. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. And in my journey, I, I had started um, with fixing and flipping, mm-hmm. uh, but then I even found a faster money was wholesaling. wholesaling. Yeah. <laughs> Lower remember, risk too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I remember that, that first, the first time I signed a piece of paper and I turned that piece of paper into $10,000 and it blew my mind. It was like the ability, and I've heard like, uh, I think it's Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki talks about, you know, money is just an idea. It's something we create. And that day when I signed that piece of paper and created $10,000 for myself and my family, the world changed. It's like, what? Now that's fast. Yeah. And the, the, like you're saying too, Cody, the, the amount of risk that's in that is is minimal as well too, you know? And you put in the work too, though, right? Because I have a lot of friends who are wholesalers in Canada, right? seven figure wholesalers. Um, and they actually, here's a crazy story, kind of a side note, but a friend of mine, seven figure wholesaler, um, while the market crash, right? Starting December, 2021, right? The interest rate started going up and all that. He had 18 flips going on. I know all hard money borrowing at 10%. Mm-hmm. So his interest payment every month is around a hundred thousand. So, and when the market turned, his partner ran away, but he has 18 projects going on. So he has to think about whether he's going to declare bankruptcy or man up and rank crank up his wholesaling side Mm -hmm. so that he can keep filling the hole and buy himself more time to get rid of some of the projects. Mm -hmm. And this is a happy ending story. I think he's halfway through it. He was on my podcast, but he was like, man, that was the craziest time. And he's like, yes, wholesaling at this point makes a lot more sense than flipping. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, yeah, I could tell, I could talk for hours uh, on this as well too, but I think the biggest takeaway, I mean, for the listeners, um, when we're talking about these, the speed of these returns or these streams of income is the shorter the shorter the time, the less the risk mm. typically, right? So um, one point example is um, development. I've, um, I always say developing is, or new builds is kind of like the cool thing, you know, it's like the sexy thing, but once you get in, it's a different thing. And especially mm-hmm. when the markets are moving, you, you, you expose yourself to more risk because the length of the project what I loved mm-hmm. about wholesaling is it's fast. Boom, it gets done, right? Mm-hmm. And yes, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, when you we say a lot I've of money signed, on marketing, absolutely. you have the whole I've deposition s- team and all that, right? I've <laughs> signed a $100,000 assignment of contract before, and that is something, right? But it mm-hmm. takes a lot. I mean, we were spending six figures a month in marketing, you know, to get these mm-hmm. deals. And I had a team of 13 people like it. You don't have to go all that way, but there's a lot that goes into these things. So you said that right. You put a lot of work in to get those deals, but it's compressing that time was what I was talking about. So that wholesale and the opposite side of that, we had acquired a piece of land, vacant land, and we were going to do site build, um, 
site condos, new construction site condos. Mm-hmm. And we had, I think, 20 units. We were all the way through permitting, had all the drawings done and everything, and COVID hit. Oh. And, yeah, so it was insane. And at that time, too, we had six we had six flips at a time going. So when the world shuts down and you can't, you t- you're you you're instructed by the law that you cannot work on your projects, but guess what interest does? Interest keeps going, keeps going. So as that, the, the time bleeding. stretches, the more you expose yourself to risk in those certain types of investments. Yeah. And real estate term, I think wholesaling is the fastest money, flipping probably medium money. And you really have to watch out and buy right, buy low. And development, I will say medium to a lot longer terms too, because there's so many variables. If it turns out right, you can make a lot of money mm-hmm. and it just drags out longer. You have to make sure you have enough buffer to pay all your investor, p- pay all the interest rate and any reserve fund in case a lot of things could happen oh, yeah. in development, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. I think you're going to have it all, right? Yeah. Those are all what I call kill and eat too, Cody. Like those are all, I go... I shoot it and then I eat it, right? I kill it and then I yeah. eat it. Yeah, but yeah. the the other aspect of that is um, rentals, long-term rentals, short-term mm-hmm. rentals. Even though it's called short-term, it's still a long-term investment. Those mm-hmm. are the ones that that you go out, you get one time, and then they continue to, to pay you, continue to pay you. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about that with the, these different streams of income, the fast, medium, and slow. Um as far as the slow ones, is that what you're talking about too, where it's that long-term return? Because if I talk about, if I target $200 a month per mm-hmm. door, it doesn't sound like it's going to change my life. But when I step mm-hmm. back and look at the big picture and I start mm-hmm. compounding these things together and reinvesting that money, it, it changes, right? Mm-hmm. So is that what you're talking about with a slow stream yeah. of income? So it's funny because I own real estate too. I have a small all the way small from small single family to like mid size uh uh three four units and my business partner owns like apartment buildings and all that um in canada anything less than 15 unit a multifamily doesn't really work oh, unless wow. you manage it yourself because our price are so high cost mm-hmm. of doing business is so high and we're not very pro business in canada mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hard to you know, turnover tenants and, and, and just the government regulation, all that. So when I say slow money, I truly means like, I keep dumping money in there. So f- for example, the properties, a lot of properties I own has 50% loan to value for people who doesn't know if it's worth a million, it only has half a million mortgage on it. So if I really want to, if the cash flow makes sense, I can pull out the equity and go buy next property or go do some other venture or if something do happen, I can live on it. Mm-hmm. So those are the money that I keep howling at while the business and everything else is going good. But if something do happen, I can withdraw from it. I can sell the house if I need to, but I don't plan on it. I'm keep building, right? I keep four, five, six, seven until the point I'm stopped. I'm like, holy cow, all these mortgage are mostly pay off, right? So these are the true cash flow that come in. But if you have mortgage on it, right? Everyone's seen it. The interest rate gone up like double. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, it, that can take a toll on all the cash flow. So I don't really count those cash flows since like 2019. I never count those as cash flow. All the money just go in because when turn a tenant turnover, I need to renovate the house a little bit, upkeep. So all the money I make is from appreciation and mortgage pay down mostly. And the cash flow, 200 per door it sounds cool but it's only 2400 mm-hmm. per year it's, it usually goes back in right when right. there's turning 10 over so i don't treat those as true cash flow but it's the appreciation part and the mortgage pay down and of course a lot of write-off and all that that's the true power of real estate mm-hmm. yeah we call that i call that the stackable returns i've been taught to call the stackable returns the nice. principal pay down, the cash flow and hopefully when you're acquiring you're, you're figuring that that you call it turnover, the tenant turnover. So I'm, I have reserves pulled back every month out of my uh, income. So I've got maintenance and vacancy reserves built into mm-hmm. that. That leaves me that cash flow. So hopefully there's a little bit of cash flow there for you. 
like you say, mm-hmm. the the appreciation is something that's going to happen, but I don't take into account on my acquisition side for those. Mm-hmm. And then depreciation, which may be a little different in Canada uh, yeah, than you guys here in the States. have a lot more flexibility. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. <laughs> There's that depreciation. We yeah. can only do so much. We don't have 1031 exchange. We can't do tax segregation, like depreciate yeah. everything in the first year. We can't do that. So wow. that's why we're drooling and can't. All the Canadians yeah. are drooling. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting. Very interesting. So I, I also on on your stuff, I see this word fire a lot. Tell me a little bit about what fire means to you. Yeah, the fire really, when I first started, because I, I started on my own in 2019 and that was right before COVID. Um, at that time, when I thought fire was innocently, my trading account is making more money than my full-time Gig because mm-hmm. I was a I, was, I graduated as an engineer before I quit at age twenty nine I was a mid management managing eleven engineers. My life looks cool, but it's actually quite miserable for the money I pay, the amount of stress I take on. So um, I decide to to just quit. I know I have more potential. That's when I start my YouTube channel, all that. But because I have the fast money, figure out. The income still kept coming in consistently. I have, I bought myself time. I traveled to Spain and then I started my YouTube channel. I think six months after when the COVID happened, when I have nothing to do, that's really what bought me the time. And I would say that was my f- first taste of financial freedom. And then we continued to, you know, buy more real estate and continue to help more people and continue to, um, Lower the risk, right? For example, flipping is a higher risk. Okay, maybe I do wholesaling more, right? So for us, it's like we were picking individual stocks, but now we don't pick individual stocks. We just focus on S&P 500. All our strategies on S&P 500. It's all about preserving capital because when you have a bigger account size, now I have a seven-figure just in trading account using our strategy. It's not about the overall return. It's about minimizing the stress, minimizing the risk, preserving capital, and grow it consistently. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's really where all the fast, media, slow money, right? So fast money is our send down strategy. Money keep coming in and I have coaching as well. I have consulting as well. And I have short term rental as well. All those mm-hmm. money keep coming in and I go and say, okay, do I want to do a burr? Uh, do I want to do more Airbnb arbitrage or what do I want to do? Right. Do I want to, uh, build another house in the back? Um, then, you know, all these making money and I go buy more real estate and I just, after I stabilize it, I put in buy and hold and I buy more, you know, um, whole life insurance and um, just keep buying those index ETF and just piling it there. Right. So um, that's my version of financial freedom. I don't really have a figure. I just, what, after a certain point, your expense doesn't go up as much uh, to, to really have a good lifestyle. Uh, I think things will change once I have kids and all that, mm-hmm. my fiance and all that. Oh, everything really- changes. Everything changes when you have kids, Cody. <laughs> so my fire is my true fire at this point. And it'll continue to evolve is I keep buying my, my time back. You have a team of 13, just on my coaching side, I have a team of eight. Marketing side, I have a team of five for ads, five for podcasts, like all that. So that I buy my time back. So when I have kids or if something do happen, I can drop everything and everything continue to run. That's my version of financial freedom and money don't stop because I am paying my parents for the retirement on that. So that's my version of financial freedom. That's my fire. I like that. That's my fire. So I love, um, I love living by design, right? This idea that, uh, I'm content, but I'm not complacent. Like I'm happy. I'm blessed. I love what I do and where I'm at. And every now and then when somebody asks me, it's always interesting. Like I'm at the gym or something and somebody asks me, Hey, what do you do? I was like, I'm retired. You know, what do you do? And the look on their face yeah, is just they like, look at you, right? And like, look at you. You look so young. I look yeah. so young. They were like, yeah. ah, yeah, you must have a rich parent. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I love it. It's just that way of even, even in that way of like 
speaking things into reality too. It was like, I'm retired. Like I work every day, but I'm retired. I wouldn't call what I do work because it's absolutely, I mean, look what we're doing right now. You know, we're sharing our experiences that are to do's and to not to do's right with other people. So they could grow. I mean, do you consider this work? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I live in real estate. I mean, it's just, it's just awesome. I love it. And it's so fun just to watch people's face on that because my fire is very similar to yours. It's just, oh, nice. I'm, I'm living the life that I've designed, right? And that idea of if I want to go out, I could go out for a week. And actually, our children are homeschooled now. And if we wanted, we could literally, I can work from anywhere in the world. So I could pick up. I'm thinking about that. I'm actually thinking about that. Because I say in Toronto, Canada is the most expensive city in Canada. Uh And a lot of time I'm like, why why am I here? Yes, my mom is here. My dad is in Taiwan. But the winter is so long here. What am I doing here? So I travel usually like once every month kind of thing. And it gets tired of traveling too. I'm not lying to everyone else. Like if you think, see all those influencers traveling, it's actually quite tiring. Yep. So I only do it like 10 days and I need to come back and like, yep. okay, I hate traveling. Okay, now yep. I want to travel again, right? Yep. The one hard thing about that and uh, you know, a lot of people now with this, uh, what is it called? Nomadic lifestyle, like picking up and moving and going wherever you want. The one challenge, like you say, it is draining, but you, Great. you literally have to set up your system everywhere you go because I've got, you know, you've got things that you have to do no matter where you're at, uh, mm-hmm. to, to be, uh, to be healthy. Right. So you yeah. got to set up and restart every time you go somewhere. It's just draining. It drains your efficiency. Uh, you know, so I, I'm a fan of travel and I love seeing different parts of the world. So, and we get to do that because, because of our fire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And uh, now you have kids. So schooling it's good that you guys are homeschooling um but i kept being told that kids need to interact with other kids so 100 percent. They're, they're like cody you need to think about that it's not just about what you teach them they need to have a normal social life so they're yeah. normal <laughs> yeah absolutely and each i mean we have two young kiddos and they each have their own personality so how they interact is going to be different their desire to interact is different as well too but always always um you know, it's just like us when we are learning expanding associations and limiting associations. So making sure that we're giving them the opportunity to to do this themselves as they're growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe you should have another kid. I heard that if you have one, he's gonna he or she's gonna be lonely. If you have two, you have a little kind of like a conversation. But if you have three, you have a small society because you yes. have a tiebreaker. Yeah. So they start negotiating <laughs> with each other. You will see the whole society working. Uh, anyway, awesome. just throwing that out. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what we can do about that one, Cody. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, if you could go back, um, I don't, I don't know if ten years would be too long, but if you could go back, maybe to that point where you were studying or have your engineering degree, you're in your, you know, you're working as an engineer. What's something that you would tell yourself back then? Um, it's funny. I look at your question, like, what will you tell yourself, your 30 year old self? And I'm yeah. like, I'm 32. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the last four years has been amazing. Once you start taking calculated risks, take things under control, try and error, fall for all that. Um, if I would tell myself like 10 years ago, some, somebody might not like this, but I'm like, like thinking if I should really go into engineering school, because the amount of tuition I pay was 120000 If I buy any real estate or get a mentor in that world, I think I'll go a lot further. But I did not have that kind of kind of guidance and I did not have someone who pushed me enough to take that kind of risk. But if you have someone kind of like the rich dad, poor dad, if you have a rich dad, I have a poor dad in real mm-hmm. life and I have a godfather that's a rich dad. Mm-hmm. Huge in real estate, doing wholesaling, flipping, being in Orlando, US, and all that. And that's my rich dad. So if someone like that could guide me a lot early on, I'll probably take a little bit more risks and just dive in. And a year at that time, you're like, a year is a lot, a gap year is a lot. But hey, man, I see a lot of successful people take a gap year and never look back. And what's the worst case that could happen? Right. 10% of people come back and find another job, and you're a lot more hireable because you shown to the company that you could take risks and you try to figure it out and you fail. That's cool. At least you know what will make you fail, right? So that's my personality might not work for everyone, but that's if I could tell my younger self, 
I would say take more risks when you have a lot less liabilities. That's awesome. And um, I don't know if you've heard Alex Hermosi before, but I've heard him say, um, instead of investing, uh, investing in the SMP, invest in the SME. S- S in me. Yes. The skills in me. And that's like exactly what you were saying there of, you know, taking that, that, that taking the, the risk when you don't have the liabilities and, mm-hmm. and being able to invest in yourself and, and push. We think, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have the speed of data, the speed of information that we do now. And, you know, there's, our circles were smaller, right? It's typically then it's, it's who was around us, but now there's so many of us who get to experience so much because of Zoom, because of social media. And we have these these uh, um, pushers, you know, around us to say, hey, go try this. You don't have to fit in the box. You don't have to go to school. But all of my physician friends out there, you do have to go to school. And, uh, you know, you my please attorneys, go to school. Engineers, stay, yes. Start yes. studying as hard as possible, please, because yes. our life is on the... Yeah, absolutely. But now, but now that we have... Um, say you're through med school, you've done your thing, you have your passion. The difference maker now, Cody, is this ability that you have this platform to elevate yourself. Because what I love about what what I'm so passionate about gets me fired up is to be able to help physicians understand that now, instead of a luxury of multiple streams of income, think of it as that necessity. And now you have the opportunity to then create this. Because then when you come back, you are in medicine for a reason. Most of physicians that I've spoken with have this passion of helping people. Exactly. But when exactly. you help people because you want to versus when you need you to, to, there's yeah. a different kind of love and attention that happens. And it's yes. possible. So looking yes. at this in this slow, medium, and fast, multiple streams of income is a great way for these physicians to start building these buckets, right? And, and creating this this bridge from where they're at mm-hmm. to where they want to be and finding that fire is something that I think you could help them do too, Cody. They should look you up on, on YouTube. And um, I really think that there's a, a path forward to help because you do so much that I don't do. Um, I don't do a lot in, in stocks and trading and stuff like that. And I would love to have this platform for the listeners just to go and check you out. Right. What's the YouTube, what's, what is your YouTube link that they could find you at? Oh, it's just my first name, last name. Type in my first name, last name. You can't miss it. Or youtube.com, Cody yeah, yeah. A. Cody A. <laughs> you can't That's miss it. C-O-D-Y. Yep. Y-E-H. C-O-D-Y, Y-E-H. And take a look at that. And man, I've just, I've enjoyed our conversation here today. Is there anything in parting that you know as a physician's child that you would mm-hmm. like to say to the physicians out there who have young children or who are considering of having children? Um, I think physicians are so smart in their own way, usually the top students and all that. And sorry if I say that, usually I have a little bit of higher ego. Uh, but I think if you put that ego down a little bit and and just admit that you're very good at your medical side of things, but there's a lot of other things in life that are also important. Um, and I think if you just admit that and kind of just broaden your horizon, absorbing more stuff, or you don't have to do it yourself, like invest passively on that, just learning how to do underwriting and all that, you could truly get into the fire state of what Brad just talked about is you go to work by choice. A lot of you guys are passionate about it and if you can work less but with more passion and choose the client you want to work with i think a lot of all of you will be a lot happier just not just yourself but you will make the people around you a lot happier too i just seen a lot of physicians when they get burned out they don't care they truly yep. don't care some of my family doctors like they stood me up on my appointments and i don't blame them because i know they want to get paid if it's a new appointment, things like that, right? So um, I think if they can reach that state, I think the whole society will be better as well, not just individual family to the whole society. And, you know, Cody, I, I appreciate you 
stepping out and I, I'm the listeners know, like I will, <laughs> I will come out and straight tell, tell everybody how I'm feeling. And I appreciate you saying that because it's more than just physicians that have that tendency. And I think us as human in, in our human nature, we have this, I'm right, you're wrong kind of peace in our human nature. And as an engineer, the reason why it took me so long to become an, I, I studied engineering as well too, was nice. I, I didn't want to just create this drawing and say, this yeah. is it, go build it, right? This yeah. works. I know it works. I and didn't we're the want- same too. Yeah, we, yeah. A lot of engineers are pigeonhole, right? We're like, yes. this is right. I am right. You're wrong. Yes. My design's the best, but I'm like, okay, yes. guys, take a step back, look at a bigger picture. This is just yeah. a small thing, okay? <laughs> yeah, the same way. So for me in um, architectural engineering, it was, I wanted to know what I'm doing was right. So I went into the field. I've I've done every trade from the plumbing under the concrete to the shingles on the roof. I've I've done everything. And the the the, the biggest thing I've learned in that coding, it ties right along with this putting your ego down is I don't know everything. Yeah, I've done everything. I don't. I, I don't know everything, and I don't ever want to be the one that knows everything. Just be that sponge and absorb, absorb, absorb. And I think that mindset that you're talking about, Cody, is wonderful. Putting that down and and just become this sponge and, and bring back that childlike curiosity when it comes to these multiple streams of income. And that's how you find your fire. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's awesome. Couldn't put it better. That's awesome, man. Well, I think that's. That's a great way to wrap this up, Cody. Man, I love your I love your approach. I love everything that you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Awesome. And to the listeners out there, again, as always, thank you for your time and more importantly, your attention, because without attention, the time is worth nothing. And for you to give us that attention today, uh, intentionally downloading this podcast is awesome. Um, please check out Cody A on YouTube, uh, subscribe. And if you got any questions for us, feel free to shoot us an email, info at physicianwellsystems.com. So until next time, we'll see you.